Hello, and welcome to the first part of the Advanced Synthetic Aperture Radar webinar series for disaster and hydrological applications. I'm Dr. Erica Podest, and I'm a scientist in the Earth Science Division at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. This series contains three trainings. This one is focused on SAR for flood mapping using Google Earth Engine. The second one, on December 4th, will focus on interferometric SAR for landslide observations, which will be taught by Dr. Eric Fielding from JPL. And the third one on December 5th will focus on how to generate a digital elevation model and will be taught by Nicolas Grunfeld from CONAI, the Argentinian Space Agency. Each webinar will have a theoretical part and a demonstration. Today, I'll begin with SAR theory as related to flooding and I'll then go through a demo on how to generate a flood product with Google Earth Engine. This session builds on the previous flooding session using Google Earth Engine. Each webinar will be done in both Spanish and English on the same day. There'll be one homework associated with this webinar series and we will assign that homework on the last day. It will be in Google Form. To obtain a certificate of completion, you must have attended all parts of the series and submit the homework by the due date, which is January 8th, 2020. In all of the demos, we have step-by-step -step instructions for you to follow, and we will go at a certain pace through the demos, but we will make the recordings available within 24 hours so you can go at your own pace. Learning objectives. I expect that by the end of today's webinar, you'll be able to understand the information content in SAR images relevant to flooding. This is actually a review of what's been presented in the past. It's important that you understand why the radar signal is sensitive to flooding. For those of you that have seen this already, consider it a refresher. I'll also show you how to use Google Earth Engine to generate a flood map using Sentinel-1 images. In the previous webinar, I did a demo using Google Earth Engine to generate flood maps from Sentinel-1 SAR images by applying a threshold. This demo will focus on generating a flood map through a supervised classification approach. You'll also learn how to integrate socioeconomic data to your flood map in order to identify areas at risk. I'll start out by defining what is meant by flooding from a radar perspective. It refers to the presence of a water surface underneath a vegetation canopy, regardless of whether it is forest or agriculture. When I refer to an inundated forest, it means that underneath the vegetation canopy, there is standing water above the soil surface, as shown in the figure on the top left. In agricultural or herbaceous areas, the leaves or stems of the plants visibly emerge above the water surface, as shown in the bottom center figure. Radar can also detect flooding when or where there is no standing vegetation, and I will call this open water, such as the figure on the top right. The type of flooding discussed in this webinar can be caused by natural processes, such as the seasonal flooding of wetland ecosystems, or as a result of a natural hazard. For example, uh, hurricanes or extreme precipitation events. Some floods can also be human driven, such as flooded rice fields. Assessing and monitoring flood extent can help reduce uncertainties in the spatial and seasonal extent of methane sources and sinks associated with wetland ecosystems or the cultivation of crops that require standing water, such as rice. Also, flood maps can help monitor inundation extent and dynamics for disaster assessment and management. This slide is a refresher of the radar backscattering mechanisms in general, emphasizing with the red boxes the ones that are primarily relevant to flooded vegetation and open water. In the far left, there's specular scattering, and that occurs when there's a smooth surface, such as a calm, open water surface, and the signal scatters away from the satellite. In this example, the signal is coming from the left and scattering away from the satellite towards the right. And this results in open water appearing very dark in the image. 
The next type of scattering is rough surface scattering, which results when there's some level of roughness on the surface, causing the signal to scatter in different directions, but mostly away from the satellite. An example of this type of scattering would be a water surface that has some level of roughness caused by either short floating vegetation, wind, or heavy rain. Such an area would appear dark, but not as dark as an open water surface that is completely smooth. The rougher the surface, the larger the signal scattered back to the satellite, and the brighter that pixel will appear on the image. The next signal interaction is volume scattering, and that occurs when the signal is scattered multiple times in multiple directions within a volume or medium. In the case of vegetation, the signal can scatter from multiple components, such as the branches, stems, leaves, trunks, or the soil. And the final backscatter mechanism on the far right is called double bounce, and this results when two smooth surfaces create a right angle that deflects the incoming radar signal off both surfaces, causing most of the energy to be returned to the sensor. These areas appear very bright in the image and are commonly seen when there is flooded vegetation because of the interaction between the smooth water surface and vertical structure of the vegetation, such as the trunk. Double bounce is also characteristic of urban areas. Here we have an example of the SAR signal scattering over areas of inundated vegetation and open water. This figure is an L-band HH polarized image from the Japanese PALSAR sensor on board the ALO satellite over an area near Manaus, Brazil. The very bright white areas are flooded vegetation and the dark areas are open water. So that river that's running through the middle is dark because open water is a smooth surface and causes specular scattering. All of the very bright white areas throughout the image are flooded vegetation because of double bounce. And the striking part about this image is that in some areas you can't see specular scattering from the river because it's, the river is either too small or it's covered by vegetation but you can still see its extent through flooded vegetation because the signal is penetrating through the canopy and double bounce is occurring. This level of detail on flooded vegetation is truly a unique att attribute of radar. The satellite parameters that influence the SAR signal response are wavelength, polarization, and incidence angle. I'll start with wavelength. Generally, the longer the wavelength, the greater the capability of the SAR signal to penetrate through the vegetation canopy all the way to the surface. The table on the right lists commonly used bands in radar and their wavelength range. SARs operating at X band are generally operating at a wavelength of around 3 centimeters, at C band at a wavelength of around 5 centimeters, and at L band at a wavelength of around 24 centimeters. As you can notice, this range is quite wide. There have been several studies that have concluded that L-band is suited to detect inundation beneath a forest canopy and should be the preferred wavelength for this purpose. However, that capability of L-band and also of other bands to penetrate some forested areas can be reduced or are even non-existent depending on the gaps in the canopy or especially on the density of the vegetation. As an example, a couple years ago, I was part of a team conducting wetland studies in the Peruvian Amazon. And we overflew UAVSAR, that's an, a JPL L-band airborne sensor, over our site of interest. And at the same time that we were overflying UAVSAR, there was someone on the ground collecting in situ data. This person was in water up to his knees, however, the radar data did not see any flooded vegetation because the vegetation was simply too dense and the signal did not penetrate all the way down through the canopy. In comparison to L-band, the ability of shorter wavelengths such as C-band or X-band to penetrate vegetation, uh, the vegetation canopy is reduced. Although the penetration of C-band is limited in comparison to L-band, Studies have shown an increase in C-band backscatter for flooded vegetation during leaf-on conditions 
and especially during leaf off conditions. C-band is especially useful if the density of the vegetation is low and works particularly well in agricultural regions or in areas of low biomass. X-band sensors, for example, Terrasar X, in general have even more limited penetration through dense vegetation and as a result of high in interference with leaves where backscatter is dominated by volume scattering. However, there have been some studies that have shown the potential of X-band to identify flooded vegetation for sparse vegetation or leaf off conditions. In this case, the transmissivity of the signal through the canopy is increased due to gaps in the canopy or the very low biomass and the contribution of double bounce dominating the volume scattering. Some other studies have demonstrated the ability of X-band to map flooded vegetation in wetlands and flooded marshland and in olive groves. So in summary, L-band is better suited for dense vegetation, but shorter wavelengths might give you reasonable results, especially if there are many gaps in the vegetation. So the sh uh, shorter wavelengths are better suited for low density vegetation. Polarization refers to the plane of propagation of the electric field of the signal, which can be in the horizontal plane or in the vertical plane. Irrespective of wavelength, radar signals can be transmitted and or receive in different modes of polarization, and there can be four combinations of both transmit and receive polarizations. And these are horizontally transmitted, horizontally received, horizontally transmitted, vertically received, HV, vertically transmitted, vertically received, that's VV, and vertically transmitted horizontally received BH. Penetration depth is influenced by polarization. In forests, HH tends to penetrate deeper into the canopy because it tends to be less attenuated than VV. So HH is a better polarization to detect flooded vegetation, especially uh, in areas where there's uh, a high biomass and you have something like L-band. There's a higher uh, likelihood that HH will penetrate through the canopy and detect that standing water underneath the vegetation canopy. HV is more sensitive to volume scattering and, and is a good indicator of vegetation cover in general. Here we have an example of multipolarization images from Alos Pausar over a part of the Pacaya Samaria Natural Reserve in Peru which is a vast wetland ecosystem. These are L-band images at HH, HV, and VV polarizations. The very bright areas are where double bounce dominates, and this is where there's inundated vegetation. The very dark areas are open water, and you can clearly see the river through the middle of the image, as well as some open water bodies north and south of the river. Note the difference in backscatter magnitude between the different polarizations. If you focus on inundated vegetation, or the very bright areas dominated by double bounds, the HH polarization is the most useful one for distinguishing flooded from non-flooded vegetation. VV shows flooded vegetation to a lesser extent, and even lesser by HV polarization. So in general, HH penetrates deeper into the vegetation canopy than VV, and when striking the water surface is more strongly reflected in comparison to the VV polarization. HV is more sensitive to volume scattering because of its depolarizing characteristics. So this is an example of an RGB image containing different polarizations. False color images are an ideal way to visualize the information content of different polarizations through color combinations because you can see the information content that's unique to each polarization or combinations of polarizations. Here we have HH in the red channel, HV in the green channel, and VV in the blue channel. The pink areas in the image are those where flooded vegetation is present. Here we have an example of the effect of incidence angle variation. On the left is a Sentinel-1 VV image, and on the right is the incidence angle variation for this same image. The radar is right-looking, 
And so note that as we move across the swath from near to far range, the image becomes increasingly darker in tone, around a 3 to 5 dB difference in backscatter. So if you measure, for example, the same forest at different incidence angles, then the measured backscatter will be different, even if there has been no physical change in the forest. Every surface feature will have a backscatter value that is a function of incidence angle. So you need to be careful when comparing backscatter of a feature when there is a large variation in incidence angle, especially if your feature is at the end, at, at the near range and the far range of the image. Incidence angle can especially affect the appearance of smooth targets on the image, such as open water. Smooth surfaces can appear brighter than rough surfaces at small incidence angles, usually less than 20 to 25 degrees. Now let's discuss a source of confusion that might lead to errors when classifying open water. And again, this is a Pulsar image. It's near Manaus, Brazil, at three different polarizations, HH, HV, and VV. And you can clearly see that uh, the water is dark. But north of the river, there are areas that have either no vegetation or very low vegetation. And so these areas can be confused with open water because uh, ultimately they, they, they're very smooth areas, right? There's very little scattering going on in these areas of low vegetation. And so their, the, their backscatter response is similar to open water, especially if it's open water with some level of roughness because of the wind, for example, they can be easily confused. And one way to clear this up is by using image ratios such as HH over HV. So you also note in this example that HH and VV have a much higher sensitivity to roughness of, on the water surface to, to, for example, wind. And you can see that in HV, open water is, uh, is very, very dark. It's much darker than in HH and BV. So strictly to identify just open water, HV is the better polarization. Another source of confusion that might lead to errors when classifying flooded vegetation are urban areas. And here we have a Pulsar image containing the city of Manaus in Brazil and its surroundings up in the northern part of the image. And uh, the image also shows flooded vegetation, which uh, has a very bright backscatter. Um, so you can clearly see all of the flooded vegetation around the river. And the city of Manaus, it's quite a large city. It has a population of about 2.5 million people, including its suburbs. And the city appears very bright, similar to flooded vegetation. And the reason for this is because the dominating scattering mechanism is double bounce. Right angles form between smooth surfaces, such as roads and vertical structures, such as buildings, causing this high return. And one way to at least partly clear up this confusion between urban areas and flooded vegetation is through the use of texture measurements. And textures, they provide information about the statistics of the pixels within a box. Uh, and the size of the box is defined by the user. Some textures, such as energy or entropy, provide information about the homogeneity or inhomogeneity of the pixels within the box. And in my experience, such measures help separate urban areas from flooded areas because urban areas tend to be more homogeneous than flooded areas. SAR datasets have improved significantly in the last couple of years, and this list here shows the legacy, current, and future SAR datasets. The ones with a green box indicate that the data are currently freely available, and you can access those through either the Alaska Satellite Facility or the European Space Agency's Copernicus Hub. So note that the legacy data sets start with CSAT in 1978. It unfortunately it just flew for a couple of months. And then during the 90s, there was JRS-1, Japanese uh, L-band SAR, and ERS-1 and 2, European Space Agency C-band SAR. Uh, which went through the 2000s um, with MVSAT and ALOS-1 and RadarSat. 
than uh, followed in the 2000s. So currently there are a number of SAR satellites in orbit, like Tandem X, which is an X-band radar satellite from the German Aerospace Center. RadarSat-2, which is C-band from the Canadian Space Agency. Cosmos SkyMed, which is an Italian X-band SAR. And Sentinel-1, which is a European Space Agency SAR operating at C-band. Uh, there's also uh, PASSAR, which is a Spanish SAR operating at X-band. There's SALCOM from the Argentinian Space Agency um, operating at L-band. And there's RCM, the radar site constellation, um, from the Canadian Space Agency operating at C-band. So there are future satellites coming up, and it's actually very exciting. In the short term, we're going to have a, a NISAR, which is a NASA Indian Space Agency L and S-band SAR. And this is going to be launched right now uh, early to 2022. And Biomass is a European Space Agency P-band sensor, also to be launched around the same time frame, maybe a little earlier. So uh, they're very exciting times ahead for um, radar remote sensing. And I want to briefly touch on NISAR, which is a NASA Indian Space Agency satellite. Uh, as mentioned, will launch in uh, early 2022, operating at L and S bands. It'll have a different modes of acquisition, um, and the resolution, the spatial resolution, will be between three and ten meters, depending on the mode. It'll provide repeated observations. It'll have a 12-day exact repeat. And these observations will allow for applications such as ecosystems, hazards, and disaster monitoring that include ecosystem disturbances, ice sheet collapse, natural hazards such as earthquakes, volcanoes, um, landslides, uh, floods, etc. Next, I'll show you a demo on flood mapping using Google Earth Engine. So what we'll be doing here is using Sentinel-1 SAR images to map flood extent in an area in the east coast of the United States. Uh, this area was uh, flooded by a major hurricane called Hurricane Matthew back in 2016. So the approach here is to use Google Earth Engine to run a classification, a supervised classification. And I'll walk you through each of the steps. But before that, I'll provide some context about the Sentinel-1 images. Google Earth Engine is a great resource. Uh, it's a cloud-based geospatial processing platform, platform. It's available to scientists, researchers, and developers for analysis of different ecosystems on our planet. Uh, in order to use it, you do need to have an account, but it is free to open one up. Google Earth Engine contains a catalog of satellite imagery and geospatial data sets, including Sentinel-1. It has the entire Sentinel-1 database. So once you have an account open, this is what the Google Earth Engine code editor looks like. It's based on uh, JavaScript. There are different windows and the actual, you've got the actual code editor in the middle and uh, you can save any sort of code that you write. You can search for data sets. Uh, there's a help button. There's a task manager and many different options as explained here. So it's a matter of exploring. Uh, there is a steep learning curve, but once you are familiar with the code and all of the different um, options embedded into Google Earth Engine, it's really a wonderful resource. And the best way to become familiar with it is just to uh, uh, practice and, and explore writing your own code. The SAR database on Google Earth Engine contains uh, the Sentinel-1. And it's, uh, as mentioned um, previously, it's a SAR sensor operating at C-band, and it's a satellite from the European Space Agency. So they've got Sentinel-1A data and Sentinel-1B data. Um, they are exactly the same satellites uh, with the same sensor. Each satellite has a global coverage of every 12 days. And so between the two of them, you get, you get global coverage every six days.
Sentinel-1 has different modes of operation as listed here. There's the extra wide swath mode and that's for monitoring oceans and coasts. There's a strip mode and that's by special order only and it's intended for special needs like disasters. Then there's the wave mode which is intended for oceans. And finally there's the interferometric wide swath mode which makes routine collections over land and this is the one you want to use for flood mapping. So if you go to the link indicated here, you can access a page containing a description of the Sentinel-1 catalog on Google Earth Engine. And this page explains the different modes of images housed on Google Earth Engine as described in the previous slide. All the images are in GRD, meaning they are in the ground range projection. Uh, they are amplitude images. There are no phase images on Google Earth Engine, just amplitude images. Uh, now, depending on the mode, they might come in different polarizations and resolutions. The processing applied was done using the Sentinel toolbox, and they've applied a thermal noise removal, radiometric calibration, and terrain collection. So these images are all analysis-ready images. The only thing you will need to do is to apply a speckle filter, and I'll show you how to do that as part of this demo. Our demo will be focused on a case study in South Carolina, which is a state on the east coast of the United States. A hurricane called Matthew made landfall in this uh, state in South Carolina uh, as a Category 1 hurricane late in the morning of October 8, 2016. This hurricane was the most powerful storm of the 2016 Atlantic hurricane season, and it cost millions of dollars worth of damage. All right, so now let's start with the demo. Let's uh, uh, go through the sequence of steps that need to be applied to the image in order to generate a land cover classification on flooding. So this uh, uh, PowerPoint slide describes the sequence of steps. First, you load the images or images to be classified, so we'll be filtering through the Sentinel-1 database and identifying the images over our area of interest before the event and after the event. Then we need to gather the training data. So what we'll be applying here is a supervised classification approach. And when you're doing a supervised classification, you need to train your classifier. So we'll be collecting training data to teach the classifier what are the statistics for each class that we identify. Um, and we'll be collecting representative samples of backscatter for each land cover of interest. Then we'll create the training data set. That means we'll overlay the training areas over the images of interest, and we'll extract the backscatter for those areas. We'll uh, train the classifier, and we'll run the classification. So in this case, we'll run a CART classification, and then finally, we'll validate the results. And in addition to this, we will also overlay population density data and we'll overlay roads data. And that's for you to know how to do this and um, be able to merge different data layers so that then you can really identify areas at risk or whatever your specific application might be if you wanna identify perhaps roads that might be inundated or um, in uh, areas uh, that might be the most suitable, roads that might be the most suitable to exit the area, uh, that's the way to do it, to overlay these different layers. Um, and then I'll finish off in showing you how to export the data sets created onto uh, your drive. You can follow along with the demo for this part as well as the other two parts tomorrow and Thursday by using the software that's indicated on the training webpage. So this includes the Sentinel toolbox and creating an account with Google Earth Engine. Instructions are included there and the recordings of each part will be made available on YouTube within 24 hours uh, after each demo for you to go through at your own pace. All right, so let's start by identifying the area of interest. 
And we'll go to your Google Earth uh, code editor. So first of all, we'll identify our area of interest by, we'll select here, the draw a line icon, okay? And we'll just draw a line more or less over our area of interest. So that includes the city of Charleston in South Carolina. Here's the city of Charleston. And let's just do something along these lines here. OK. And then you go up here. This is the polygon that we just identified. Click on it. Click on the wheel and change the name from geometry to ROI. So that is now officially our region of interest. That's where we want to focus. OK. So next, we load the images or images to be classified. Right. So let's copy this code. And we paste it on our code editor. OK, so what this is saying is we are searching the database for Sentinel-1 images, SAR images. So remember, this is a C-band sensor. And all of the images have been processed, as discussed previously. Um, and they are in log scale. So they are in DB, these images. And so we're going through the collection, the Copernicus Sentinel-1 uh, image collection. These are GRD, they're in ground range. And we'll filter according to the instrument mode. We talked about the interferometric wide swath mode. That's the one we're interested in. And we'll do uh, an orbital properties pass. So we'll, we'll look at ascending images. Uh, the resolution is 10 meters. We want to do the search within our area of interest that we define as ROI, and we want VV and VH images. All right, so then we filter by date, and we display the images on a map. So let's just copy this and go back to our code editor. And just copy and paste. So we're filtering this Sentinel-1 collection even further. We're filtering it um, to a time frame before the event. So we're saying, all right, before the event was, where are the images between uh, October 4th and October 5th, 2016? And the after event, what are the images between October 16th and October 17th? 2016. Okay, and then we display these on the map. So let's just run this. And if you go to layers on the uh, on, on the right on the top right here on the map, you've got your two mosaics, right? So there, there are two mosaics created before the event and after the event. So let's click on before the flood. And that's a strange looking image. So let's just go in, uh, click on the cog there. And the reason it looks colored is because there are three images here. It's, it's, it's doing an RGB. We have two polarizations, VV and VH. So it's doing an RGB of VV, VH, VH. So let's just uh, visualize this image, uh, just one. So let's just visualize the VV and we'll select one band image and you can select e either VV or VH. Let's just start with the VV. We'll do apply. All right, so that's how our VV image looks like before the event. All right, so now if you remember the theory that we've covered, you can just visually interpret this and identify um, areas that are urban, so you know that urban areas are dominated by double bounds. So all of these really, really bright white areas, 
those are urban areas. That's the city of Charleston here. And you know that the really dark areas, that's open water. So you've got uh, inland water here, and then you've got the ocean water. And there is some level of roughness. Obviously, that's caused by the wind, and that might cause some confusion in the classification. This is VV with VH, that water is probably gonna look really, really dark. And then we'll, we see a lot of features here in the image. You see the, these areas, the, these are brighter, those look like the, the flood channels. And then you've got uh, these darker areas. And then here along the coast, it looks like you, there's some mangroves here along the coast. All right, so let's, for kicks, let's visualize the VH before the event. And uh, here we're stretching the image according to the, the range. And this stretch is, is adequate for VV, but not for VH. So let's just stretch this a little differently. Remember uh, VH, the values tend to be lower. So let's just stretch it from minus 25 to five, minus five. There we go. Uh, we can see, you can see that the open water is consistently dark. So that's, um, that's where uh, VHs can really make a difference in separating open water from everything else, if that's what you're interested in. All right, so now let's close this and let's unclick this and visualize after the flood. Again, we go through the same process one band, VV, let's take a look. Okay, wow, you can visually um, already see some differences here. And let's take a look at the VH. You can see there's quite a bit of flooding. These bright areas, remember that's double bound, so that's flooded vegetation. So this is coastal vegetation that's flooded after the event. And let's uh, apply the same stretch here for VH, minus 25 to minus five and see how that looks. So uh, the VH is not picking up that flooded vegetation as well. Let's try minus three. All right, so now let's go back to the VV. Uh, reset the, the range here. Let's go minus 15 and zero. Okay, and what you can do is you can overlay these. So let's... Uh, Let's do this. Before the flood, let's look at BV. And let's do minus 15 and zero. Apply, close. So if you select both of them, you can kind of overlay them. And you can control that how you overlay it uh, with this little option up here next to the name of the image. So that's before and that's after. And that gives you a sense, you know, a clear sense of the differences between those two events, those two images. But really what's really popping out are those coastal areas, how inundated those are. All right, so let's do this again. So you see these these coastal areas and even these these channels, you can see that they're brighter after the event than before the event. Um, everything in general is, is probably brighter. There's greater reflectivity because things are wetter in general. So even though things are might not be inundated in some places, um, it's just generally wetter, so. It's always good to go through these exercises just to get a sense of how the image is, uh, looks like and the differences between the images. All right, so now let's go on to the next step.
Okay, so the next step here is applying a speckle filter and then displaying the filtered image. So let's just copy this code. and paste it on our, here you go. All right, so what we're doing here is we're applying a speckle filter. As you know, one of the issues with radar images is that you've got the speckle effect, which is this graininess effect, and that's inherent of radar images. So in order to reduce that speckle, you need to apply a filter. If you don't apply a filter, uh, your classification will probably look a little grainy. Okay, and there are different size filters. Obviously, the larger the, the window that you define, the more averaging you do, the, the smoother things become, but you also are losing information. You're losing spatial resolution um, the bigger that window is. Here, we're applying just a simple um, just a, a simple uh, averaging filter, smoothing filter, and we're displaying the filtered images. So that's just a zooming in. You can see the, the speckle clearly here in the, this image. Now let's apply the filter so you can get a sense on how that image is going to look. So let's just run. All right, so here we have now, we have four images before the flood, after the flood, now before the flood filtered, and after the flood filtered. So let's just take a look at, look, for comparison, after the flood, let's go back, V, apply, and close that. So this is a non spick uh, speckle filtered image. And then now let's take a look at after the flood. Again, we go VV, apply, close. So here uh, you can overlay the original image, the non-filtered image, that's what it looks like, and the filtered image. So the, there is a, a difference, right? It, it is much smoother, the, fil the filtered image. Uh, much uh, less grainier. Okay, so now let's move on to the next step which consists of selecting the training data. Okay, so we need to train the classifier and that involves collecting representative samples of backscatter for each land cover class of interest. So let's go display the VV image, the after VV image, filter one, and start identifying our, our classes. So let's do this. And let's do this. So you go to geometry imports and you select new layer. Okay. And a new layer will pop up. And we will draw a polygon. To identify a new class and let's just call this class permanent water so here here's what we do this is our first class we'll call it open water permanent and then let's represent this class with a blue color just to make things intuitive and where it says geometry, import as geometry, select feature collection. 
And under properties, click on add properties, just call it land cover. And this class will have a value of one. Okay, so uh, you'll do the same thing for each class that you define. You'll call it, uh, you, you'll define it as a feature collection, you'll call it land cover, and then the number of the class will, will be the, the next one. So the next class will be class number two, et cetera. So let's just do this, okay. And then select water bodies that, or water areas that are permanent water bodies, right? So the ocean, that's permanent, that hasn't changed. Let's go. And here, we're, this is an example, we're doing this uh, visually. But if you have any sort of training data or data that's been validated that you know for sure those are the conditions on the ground, obviously that's always much better. I mean, how well you train your classifier is really gonna make the difference in your results. So yeah, there's an old saying, uh, garbage in, garbage out. All right, so let's just train here. That's open water. It's always good to pan around the image and try to select different areas that are open water just to make sure you have a representative sample of open water. So we know these main river channels, those are permanent. Those are the, those were there before and after the event. And okay, so then we'll define a new class. And how do we know those are permanent? Okay, well, you, you take a look at the before and after. Oops. And so you overlay them. There you go. And let's just pan around and take a look at the image. All right, there you go, there. So you can clearly see which are the water bodies that are new that weren't there before the event and uh, are now there after the event. So what we'll do is we'll train, we'll ac actually identify a class as new open water. Okay, so let's just, we can zoom in here. And sometimes it takes a little while for the images to load as you're zooming in. So you have to be patient. And that's exactly what's happening here right now. 
So let's just let it load. Usually there's a bar up here that tells you whether the image is loading or not. Okay, so there. And so all of this area is now flooded after the event. So let's just go in our new class. Let's call it open water uh, flooding. Okay. Again, geometry, feature collection, land cover, and this is our second class. And okay, so let's just identify. So every time you move around and you want to select a new polygon, you have to go in here and, and click on it. So this is a new body of water. Okay, so so now let's keep defining our classes. And the next class to define is flooded vegetation. So let's go here and add new layer. So we will call the next class flooded vegetation. And I'll make this bright pink feature collection. Again, land cover. And this is going to be our third class. So let's pan around here and identify those areas that were Flooded all of these, just all of this flooded vegetation here, these mangrove areas. So let's go in, select flooded vegetation, and draw a couple of polygons around here. Okay, so let's move on to our next class. We'll call that urban. So let's make urban nice yellow color. And land cover, and this will be our fourth class. All right, so let's identify now the urban areas. And here we'll really have to zoom in. So this is an urban area. If you're unsure, you can, again, go back to the before the flood. And you'll see that the urban areas are continue to be very bright. Um, so you might notice that there's a really bright 
spot here in the middle of the river. It's probably a ship. Okay, so let's identify a couple of these. All right, and one more. All right, so we've identified these classes and uh, for in the interest of time, I've identified two other classes, the flood channel and low vegetation. So I've done this already. Um, let me just zoom in so you can have a sense of what I've identified. I've cut, I've created a class called flood channels and those are the brighter areas. So those are, if you look across the image, you have these, what I'm, um, the, these brighter areas, I'm calling those the flood channels. So these are the light greens. And then I have a, another class, a sixth class called low vegetation, and those are the dark green areas. So those are the darker, the lower backscatter areas. They, they might not necessarily be low vegetation. They have just low backscatter, the probably drier areas. Um, so, so you define all of your classes. You go through the same process for all of them. Um, here, you, you just add a new layer. Uh, you make sure you identify it as a feature collection, call it land cover, and then identify the class number. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. And once you've done that, then what you need to do is you need to merge the collections into a single collection, and, and that's called a feature collection. So what we need to do is we need to run this piece of code. Just copy this and bring it to your code editor and paste it. I've got it in here already, so I'm not gonna paste it, I'm just gonna uncomment it. All right, so we've got the code here, and what that does is uh, we're, calling, we're calling new FC that has all of our classes. So you need to identify all of the classes that you trained for, and you need to make sure that you, uh, you give it the same name that you trained for, okay? If, if there's, if the name is off, if you've got an extra letter, it's gonna cause an error when you run the classification. So we have six classes, here are six classes, open water permanence, open water flooded, flooded vegetation, urban, flood channel, and low vegetation. And so you've got all of those six classes named here. All right? So the next thing to do is let's go back here to our PowerPoint. Um, so now we'll use this feature collection to extract the backscatter values for each land cover class identified um, in the images that will be used in the classification. So what we need to do is we need to overlay the training data on our image and extract those statistics. And so to do that, then we take this code and paste it on our text editor. So we define the bands to be used to train our data. So let's just, I've got it here already. Let's just uncomment.
Okay, so what we're saying is make sure that you, we're telling the algorithm to extract the backscatter statistics for each land cover class for these two bands, VV and VH, for our before filtered image or mosaic and after filtered mosaic. Okay, so here we're telling it use both of these mosaics and VV and VH. So remember, in, in total, we have four bands. We have two polarizations for each mosaic. And we're using all of those to extract the training statistics and to run the classification on. All right, so the next step is to train the classifier. And there are different classifiers that we can use. In this case, we're using CARTs, which is classification and regression trees. So copy this and take it to your editor. And what this is doing is we're telling it to use CARTs to train the classifier. Okay. So we've got the the, the training data, use the training data, land cover. So all of our classes, that it's a, it's a feature collection called land cover, and use all of the bands that we identified. So we identified VV and VH. All right, so make sure you, you save and you can run. Nothing's gonna happen yet. So the next step is to run the classification. So in the PowerPoint, I've got a, it's just a simple one-liner that runs the classification. So we've trained the classifier, now we run that on all of the pixels of uh, the images that are being input into the classifier. Okay, and that would be, copy this, and uh, also copy this code here. So this displays the classification. So let's go back and let's just unselect this. Oh, save. Okay, so what we're doing now is we're telling it run the classification with all bands and generate a, a, a classification. It's called classified, not very original name. You can name it whatever you want. And then um, display the results, display the classification. And what this is doing is we're setting the palettes, the colors for the different classes that we identified. And there's some weird uh, codes here that is coming directly from the colors that we assigned. So each color has a color code that's associated with it. That's the color code. So what I did was I copied that code for each class and I pasted it here. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six different color codes that we're identifying here. So let's just, uh, let's save this and let's run. Okay, so that is our classification. We've got now five bands here to display. We're displaying classification. It's not perfect, as I said. I mean, you, you really do need to meticulously define your training areas to get a nice classification, but we're picking up the what I call the flood channels. We're picking up the flooded areas here in along the coast. There's some noise here between what we define or what I define as open water and, and flooded open water. Um, and we're picking up the urban areas. Those are the yellow areas here. So this can certainly be refined. You can play around whether you want to use uh, just one band up here, VV or, or VH, or if you want to use two bands. Again, you can play around with the classifier if you want to use a different classifier. Uh, there are lots of options, but this just kind of walks you through the steps so, so you know um, what the the process is. Okay, so now the next thing we want to do is we want to create a confusion matrix. So we want to really assess the accuracy of our results. 
And um, what we'll be doing here in this example is we're assessing the accuracy of the training data to determine how well the, 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 the results, how good the results are, you know, how, how well the classifier performed. So what this is doing is it's taking a part of the training data and it's using those to, to validate, to create this, this um, confusion matrix. So for a true validation accuracy, you actually want to select two different um, samples, okay? So you've got your training samples and you've got your test samples. That's really what you want to do. So you copy this code, create a confusion matrix, and let's go back. I've got it here, deselect, and let's run it and see the results. So it's telling us that the classification accuracy is 87%, 0.87. And then it's giving us here the confusion matrix. So the way to read this is, so it's got seven, you've got seven values here starting from zero. All right, so basically it's telling us here that all of the pixels that were identified as permanent open water were classified as permanent open water for this validation. The ones that were identified as open water flooded, so that would be this class here, that would be the second, the second class. Uh, it's telling us that these number of pixels were classified as flooded vegetation, urban, into these other classes. Right, so the third class that we identified, which was flooded vegetation. So most of the pixels were classified as flooded vegetation, but there were misclassifications as flood channels or what, what was called low vegetation. Okay, and so on. So what we identified as urban, this is indicating that everything that was identified as urban was actually classified as urban. Um, in the validation. Again, uh, for a, a true assessment of your classification accuracy, you do have to select uh, independent uh, test data. All right. So, the, but that gives you a general, uh, 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 an assessment of how well your, a quantitative assessment of how well your classifier performed. So now, in addition to this, you can also do other things. Since Google Earth Engine has several different databases, you can overlay different types of um, data sets on your final product. And so what I've done here is I've uh, pulled in a population data. So maybe if you're looking at areas, um, if, if this is a disaster and you want to take a look at um, populated areas that were flooded, or population density, you can overlay this layer. And to do that, um, you copy this code. Let's just And let's save this and run it. And so what we're doing now is we can overlay population density information. So this is a population density layer. And so within your area of interest, you know, as a, a, a disaster manager, for example, you know then which areas you want to really focus on. And another interesting data set that I thought would be very useful 
especially for disaster related applications is to add a road layer and there is uh, such a database at least for the united states on roads um, and that's called a tiger data set so we save this and we run it And this might be might take a little while because it is it is a very large data set. But while that is running, let me just show you the different data sets that you can pull. I mean, if you scroll down here under scripts, you've got uh, a list of all of the different data sets that you can pull in. So here we have the population density, population count. Um, you've got the satellite data sets. You've got environmental data sets. Uh, you've got to topography, lithology, landforms. So there's a lot that you can explore in terms of overlaying your data sets. And the one that contains the roads is the tiger data set. Um, so here we have this. This is the one that we use, Tigers 2016 roads. You can also overlay like county boundaries, state boundaries, et cetera. So this roads data set is a big, a, a bit of a large data set. And every time you zoom in, it just takes a little while to, uh, to load up. So that gives you a sense then of just the type of things that you can overlay depending on, on your interest. So, so these are all the roads. Uh, really a lot of detail. All right, so let's go back. Now the final step is um, saving the image. So how do you export your results? Right, so copy this, there, there are different ways to export, you can, in this example, we're exporting to our Google Drive or to your Google Drive, um, individual Google Drive. And so uh, let's just copy this and go back here. We're exporting as a GeoTIFF. And let's just save and then run. And what you do is, so here's the image. It, we, we're calling it flooding and that's going to go on your Google Drive and you run and a, a window pops up so this is uh, the name of the image if you want to create a specific folder to put it in oh sorry this is the task name this is the file name we're calling it flooding let's just call it flooding uh, hurricane Matthew. And you run it and it will then save this on your drive. So you go into your drive and it should be there as a geotip. Okay, so hopefully this uh, has just given you an overview, an idea of uh, the steps that you need to go through in order to generate a classification, in this case, a uh, uh, classification of flooding, flooding extent. And it, this is all a matter of practicing. You can play around with things, different options, just to see what gives you the best results. The nice thing is things run relatively quickly and uh, all of the data sets are there already on Google Earth Engine. So you can overlay a lot of different 
data sets on your final product um, for ancillary information. Okay, so with that, I conclude this, uh, this first part of this webinar series. Uh, don't forget that we have two other parts to this. Um, tomorrow, December 4th, we'll have our second webinar, and that will be taught by Dr. Eric Fielding from JPL. And that one will be about landslide observations using, using interferometric SAR. On, what, on Thursday, December 5th, we'll have the third part of this webinar series focused on how to generate a digital elevation model. And that one will be taught by Nicolas Grunfeld from the CONAE, which is the Argentinian Space Agency. So we're very excited about having these uh, two guest speakers and about the topics they'll be covering. Uh, for any contacts, questions, you can send me an email or anyone else on this list. Um, don't forget that the material is going to be available online. The recordings and the presentations will be online for you to be able to go through these. There will be one homework associated with this webinar series, and we will assign that homework on the last day. And now we'll open up our question and answer session. So please type your questions into the box and we'll get to them one by one. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's uh, start with the questions. We've written down your questions on the doc that you see on the screen. All right, so question number one. Which method of water body extraction approach, pixel-based, object-based, or water index, gives one the best results in case of using SAR? Hmm. I haven't compar uh, con compared different methods, and I think this would depend on the size of your water bodies. So for example, maybe if you have a small river that kind of appears and disappears, um, you might want to do some sort of object-based uh, approach. So I think it's something that uh, you'll have to explore to see which yields the best uh, results. Question two. Is there a standardized correction for the effect of incidence angle variation? Is it applied to Google Earth's Sentinel image library? So there are many different ways of doing incidence angle correction uh, with mixed results. And uh, the, the Google Earth engine does not apply an incidence angle correction. This is not something you need to do in order to, um, to do analysis with the images necessarily. You might have to cut the edges. So if the incidence angle variation um, is uh, too obvious and you can see it visually, you can see it or you can look at the pixel values on the edges of the image, uh, then just, just cut off the edges and focus on the, the middle part of the image. So the interferometric wide swath mode images, their incidence angle varies from about 29 degrees to around 46 degrees. All right, question number three, what are the possible reasons for not forming a perfect interferogram in a low vegetation, high perpendicular baseline and good temporal resolution terrain? That's a great question. And the next two webinars are going to be focused on INSAR, and they will cover uh, this, um, this issue that you just asked. And we'll have two experts on INSAR. Tomorrow, we'll have Dr. Eric Fielding talking about landslides. And on uh, Thursday, we'll have Nicolas Grunfeld on how to generate a digital elevation model. 
Question number four. By texture, do you mean something like GLCM hieralic measures? Yes, absolutely. That's what I mean. Um, and uh, the SNAP software has uh, texture measurements or uh, texture options that you can generate for your image. So I suggest you play around with those and see how well you can or how much better you can um, separate some classes that might have confusion. Uh, if, for those of you using Envy, there are also texture measures in Envy, and uh, there are probably other texture measures that you can apply using open source softwares like um, R or Grass or GLDAS or, uh, yeah, or Grass, sorry. Okay, the next question. How does one detect vegetation inundation in densely populated urban areas? In this tutorial, the brightness value for urban and vegetation inundation is the same. That's right. So it's it's difficult. And that's why in the, the theory part, I included a, a short discussion on sources of confusion in when detecting inundated vegetation and that's urban because it's the same backscatter mechanism you've got that double bounce mechanism um, and so you have double bounce in areas where there's inundated vegetation and you've got double bounce in areas where there is um, in urban areas right so you can detect inundation in urban areas and areas where say there are no tall buildings, for example. So you, urban areas, you've got a lot of green areas, you've got parks and golf courses and, and, um, and fields. And so in those areas, you can detect um, inundation either as open water or inundated vegetation. It's just a, a matter of, um, of knowing where those areas are so you can properly classify or train your classifier. So that's one of the reasons that radar is really not that totally effective in looking at inundation in urban areas, just because you already have double bounce as uh, as a dominant backscatter mechanism in, in, uh, in urban areas. Okay, question number six, how long does it take to get a Google Earth Engine account accepted? I've been waiting since the last webinar in early September and still they have not approved my account. Hmm. So it should not take that long. In fact, it should be a 24 hour thing. So if you've been waiting since uh, September, then there's certainly an issue. Maybe the, the email, the confirmation email uh, went to your spam or uh, folder. So you might wanna try again or check your spam folder. Question number seven, can you explain about green space analysis? Hmm. I don't think I understand what is meant here by green space analysis. So you'll have to uh, maybe write out what you mean by green space analysis. If, if you mean areas where there's vegetation and what sort of analysis are you referring to? Uh, if you're talking about greenness, then radar is not sensitive to the chemical properties of the vegetation. For that, you would use something like NDVI or um, some other measure of uh, greenness. Question number eight, is it possible to overlay roads and other infrastructure data with your flood extent layer outside of the US in Google Earth Engine? 
for example, using OpenStreetMap data? I, I believe so, yes. So as you saw, there is a database of what is currently sitting in Google Earth Engine, but you can also overlay your own uh, vector files or you can export the product that was generated and imported into your own software like QGIS and then overlay whatever um, data layer you have. Question number nine, is it recommended to apply a speckle filter when a small area is assessed? I think that I think the resultant segmentation would miss data. Hmm. Okay. So uh, you should apply a speckle filter, even, even if it's a small area. What you'll want to do is perhaps play around with the size of the filter. And it's always going to be a trade-off. Anytime you apply a speckle filter, you will lose some resolution, right? Obviously, the bigger that filter, the more resolution you'll lose. However, you'll have a cleaner image and you'll have less of less speckle, which uh, doesn't means for a cleaner classification. Question number 10. Is there a possibility to integrate SAR data with other freely available data, for example, Landsat 8 and other in-situ data for better visualization? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, so in Google Earth Engine, for example, you do have the Landsat 8 database and you can integrate those data sets. In fact, you can use many different layers and run your classification with different layers. You can have uh, optical images and, and radar images and see how well uh, you can, uh, your classification results are. And you can also um, add in situ data. Okay, question number 11. What to do if ROI is not defined in this scope? Hmm. I'm not sure what that means if, if the region of interest is not defined in this scope. So uh, basically you're defining the region of interest, right? So at the beginning we drew a box around our area of interest and that was the RI, so I'm not sure what this is referring to. Maybe you can clarify. All right. Question number 12. With editing the dates, can we use this code script for another area? Yes, absolutely. And the whole idea here is this is just an example of uh, what you can do for a given area, but you can totally take the script and that's the whole idea. Take the script and modify it. And uh, you can define a different ROI, but your region of interest, you can define in the search parameters, you can define different before and after uh, uh, dates. So uh, yes, that's the, that's, that's what uh, we want you to do, is to use this code script for other areas. And you'll have to play around with it a little bit to see, uh, to make sure that there are images available for the dates that you're defining. Why are urban areas represented by a white color in Google Earth Engine? Question number 13. So the reason for this is because urban areas are dominated by double bounce. And so there's a really very high return in these areas. Question 
Question number 14. Can I add a new layer in order to overlay with my results? If yes, how? Uh, yes, absolutely. And uh, we showed this. So I think someone got very excited about uh, what could potentially be done. And, uh, and that's what we got to at the end. So you can overlay many different layers on your, uh, on your generated product. Question number 15, is SAR imagery as shown in this webinar useful to detect and quantify urban flooding to or just flooded vegetation areas? Um, I, it's more effective, much more effective in, in vegetated areas. To a certain extent, you can look at urban flooding. As mentioned, it's not so much in the areas where it's densely urban, where you have a lot of buildings uh, and roads because those areas are going to be dominated already by double bounce okay and and you can look at this look at the before and after and you'll see that those very bright areas in the before image are um, as bright and uh, the extent is about the same in the after image so those areas are are um, SAR is not very effective and, and densely urban areas, but urban areas do have parks and open areas, and you can detect whether those areas are inundated, whether there's open water. So you can look at uh, the before and after and see if there's open water, if there's specular scattering, say, in areas where there's uh, a park or, or um, open uh, areas. Okay, great question. Question number 16. For one class, how many samples should one use? That's a great question. I mean, one of the things that you really need to keep in mind is you need to have a good statistical sampling of each class. So if you have five pixels defining your one class, that's not a large enough statistical sample. So you do, you want to select at least on the order of 500 to 1,000 pixels. And so just select, try to select your areas as, as pure as possible and try to select your classes across the image so to make sure that you're characterizing each class uh, throughout its, uh, the variability in, in each class. All right, question 17, do you need global SAR data or more local data? Okay. It totally depends on your, your needs, right? So if you're developing some sort of uh, global or regional product, uh, you can, Uh, use data that covers a, a water, wider region. If, if you need local data, you can also just pull data over your localized region. So it totally depends. The nice thing about Google Earth Engine is that all the data is there and you can easily do like those global analysis um, Easily, okay, so it might take a, a little while. It does run in the cloud, but it's much more efficient than doing it on your computer. Okay, question 18. During the merge of two or more images, I get some unexpected strips. How can I remove those small strips? Actually, there is a, a code uh, that can remove those uh, strips and I'm happy to pass that uh, to you. If you send me an email, I'll send you the code. Question 19. 
Question number 19. Could you please let us know if the training sample size would affect the result? If so, how many training samples are ideal for selection? So we touched on this. You need a, a representative sample size so you can statistically describe each class. Uh, but if yes, if you have a training sample size that is too small, you, it will definitely affect re the results. I mean, remember, your classification is going to be as good as your training data. So uh, you might have good representative samples of each class, but if your classes are are not very, if your your training is not very good, if the quality of your training is not very good, your classification is not going to be very good. So it's very important to uh, have um, in situ or some sort of validation data where you know that the training that you're selecting for each class, that the pixels, the training pixels for each class are representative of your class. Okay, great question. How will the classifier 20, question number 20, how will the classifier algorithm differentiate between open water flooded and open water permanent? They have the same values. They all appear dark, that's, that's true. They all appear dark, they all have the same values, that's very true, except you're using two images here. Remember, you're using the before and you're using the after. And you have open water flooded, what, what I'm calling flooded, in the after image, not, but not in the before image. Okay, so question 21. Okay, so to close off on question 20, so so the the you you train it, you train the classifier uh, with these classes with with these training classes open water permanent open water flooded that one is in one image and it's not in the other image and so the final result will uh, characterize that open water flooded Question 21, how do you define urban areas, hard surface and paved areas? So the way I define urban areas are just the very bright backscatter areas that I know are in an urban environment. Okay, And if you have doubts of whether that area of really high bright backscatter is actually urban you can go to google earth engine and see what's there uh, sorry uh, google earth and and look at the the images and see what's there or just look at the before and after and if it's really bright uh, and it's not changing then uh, that that is an, an urban area if it's really bright in the areas that you know are urban and it's not changing, that that is a, just a, a very dense urban area where you have streets and you have buildings that are causing that high backscatter return. So question number 22, can we download these data using Google Earth Engine? Uh, yes, and that was the last step that I showed you, how to download the data, how to save, and and, uh, and then you go to the, your Google Drive and you download the data set from there. Question 23, can we use this data for our PhD research publications? Uh, 
I don't see uh, why not. You'd have to, I, I suggest you discuss this with your advisor and just make sure that uh, proper credit is given to, uh, to, to ESA for use of their images, as well as Google Earth Engine for providing the platform. What is the role, question 24, what is the role of SAR in river modeling studies? Hmm. I'm not sure, this is kind of a broad question, but I can tell you that one thing that you can do with SAR, uh, with radar images is uh, generate a digital elevation model, which shows you um, how through, through changes in elevation, uh, areas where the likelihood of the, where water should be routed. Question 25. Oh yeah, um, sorry, going back to question 23. Um, in, in using this data for PhD, I mentioned giving credit to ESA, Google Earth Engine, and also Copernicus. Okay, question 25. Does Sentinel also provide DM? If yes, what is the resolution? Okay, so the Sentinel-1 data that's on Google Earth Engine is analysis ready. The only thing you need to do is apply a speckle filter. So this data has been radiometrically corrected and, and terrain corrected. And to do that terrain correction, uh, it uses a DM, a digital elevation model. And it uses uh, the SRTM, I believe it uses the SRTM 90 meter DM where available and outside of areas where SRTM is not available, it uses Aster. So in Google Earth Engine, you can download a DM. It's part of the Google Earth Engine database. In fact, I believe there are several DMs available on, on Google Earth Engine. And you can use a DM, for example, as a layer into your classification. Question 26, is Sentinel data available frequently in the Indian region? I, the, that depends on what you mean by frequently. So the each, Sentinel-1 satellite, so there's Sentinel-1A and B, has a 12-day temporal repeat. And between the two of them, it's about six days. And in some regions, the coverage is denser than in other regions. But I think it, it's a matter of doing a um, just a search through the Google Earth Engine database to see what sort of coverage you have in the Indian region. Question 27. Is it possible to have free local SAR data for a specific place, for example, here in Madagascar? Yeah, absolutely. So this, this data, data sets, this database is global, okay? There is Sentinel-1 data over India. There is Sentinel-1 data over Madagascar. Uh, I suggest you go and you query the, the database to see what sort of coverage you have in Madagascar. And it's, it's all free, all of this data is free. So you can access it through Google Earth Engine and work on the cloud 
or you can, <clears throat> you can download individual images. And uh, work with them on your computer using the Sentinel toolbox. Okay, question 28, what are the different classifiers and which one performs the best? I know we're using CART here. Uh, there are, you, you'll have to go and take a look. There's supervised classifications, there's unsupervised classifications. I suggest uh, going with the supervised classifications, so you, those usually give you better results. Uh, random forest tends to perform really well, CART and, and especially random forest. Question 28, the classification by SAR images can be improved using classification by optical images. Um, possibly, it could possibly be improved. I'm not sure. I would suggest uh, first playing around with the radar images and maybe generating some textures, uh, perhaps pulling in a digital elevation model and then seeing what sort of results you get. And you can also test by bringing in optical data. Optical will really help in areas where there's confusion with some of the classes that you're defining with the radar data. So for example, one of the things I talked about in the theory part was that you might have some confusion in areas where there's open water and areas where there's low vegetation or there's like bare soil. These areas are dominated by um, either specular scattering or, or just very low backscatter. And so there might be some confusion and optical images might be able to help separate those areas and help clear up that sort of confusion. So how many classes would be enough for training in order to get the best results? So we've touched on this, but now in terms of classes itself, it's a matter of it's not really how many classes it you can you can train for many different classes and so even within one class if you see a certain variability within one class you might want to divide it into two you might want to say well this is um bare soil and this is an area with very low vegetation they'll look very similar but they're slightly different and then you can always merge the classes in your final classification if the results are not good yeah. and one way to see how well your classes uh, separate or how distinctive they are is to just look at the histogram of your classes. Look at the, the histogram of all your classes and see what sort of overlap they have. All right, so the next question, how does one export the imagery to use in another image processing software? Okay, so at the end, I showed you how to save it as a GeoTIFF. This then goes into your Google Drive and you just export that and you can open it in QGIS. Question 32, how to decide on the number of classifications for the study area? On the number of classifications. 
I'm not sure I understand this question. Uh, maybe on the number of classes. If so, if it is the number of classes, it just depends on what you want to classify, right? Now, you do want to kind of cover the broad range of variability in the image. So even though you might just be interested, say, in open water, you can't just classify for open water. You, uh, you, you, you want to classify for, well, all right, let's classify for open water and everything else, land. All right. Question number 33. I am not clear on what data were used for accuracy assessment. Usually we use an independent data set. How will you input independent data set? Yes, so I did, this is a very good point and I did uh, mention, touch on this briefly, but I'm glad uh, you brought it up because you wanna do your accuracy assessment on areas that are independent from your training areas, right? So if you do your accuracy assessment using the same pixels that you use to train your classifier, uh, you're not really getting a true accuracy assessment. It's biased, right? So ideally you want like a, a second set of, um, of defined classes that you can then use to validate your results. And in order to do that, it's the same way, it's the same way we created this feature collection and we called it uh, land cover. Uh, you, again, you create one just like that, just call it something else. And then when you run the, uh, the validation, you call that validation data set. Okay, question 34. For classification, is it mandatory to use polygons or can you actually use point data? For instance, if you use the point data from a survey like Lucas for land cover. Yeah, absolutely. You can use point data, except the thing, the problem about point data, it's, it's just a point. And this goes back to yeah, what is an adequate number of, of samples. So you wanna characterize each class in a statistically representative way. And if you have, unless you have a lot of, lot, lot, lot of point data, then that's fine. But if you just have a couple of points, then that um, you, you might not get as uh, very good results. Okay, question 35, are the tiger roadmaps and the population density only for the US? So the population density, I believe that is global. The tiger roads map, I believe that is just for the US. Question 36, will it be correct if I use a mosaic average values of all the S1 images in a month to estimate flooding in that month? So you don't want to use mosaic average values for a whole month, just because, especially in looking at flooding, because flooding, it can be dynamic and things can change in a relatively short period of time. So really doing an average over a month might not give you a representative result of flooding extent. Question 37, could you send us the polygons so we have the same data set, especially for the land cover? 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Just send me an email and I'd be happy to send you the polygons. So question 38, did you use training samples for validation? How do you use validation samples in this case? So I think that was answered in the previous question. Question 39. Question 39. All right. Is it recommended to apply a speckle filter when a small area? 14 hectares is assessed. I think that the resultant segmentation would miss data. Uh, the thing about a speckle filter, even if it's a small area, uh, you still have the effect of speckle will translate into your final classification product. So you do want to apply some sort of filter. And my best advice is just run it both ways. It's very quick, especially if you're working in a relatively small area and, and compare the results. Question number 40, we took to analyze with images with resolution 10 by 10 meter, but exports to Google Drive result image with resolution of 100 by 100 meters. Why is this? Uh, it might be the way that the export was defined. And even though the original image is 10 by 10 meters, that the actual resolution is going to be reduced what, after you apply the filter. Question 41, what about doing the same for drought? Uh, yeah, that's a, a great point. Actually, RSET has had some uh, webinar series looking at drought. And for that, you bring in other data sets like soil moisture to look at uh, the extent of, of drought and how that's changing with time. Huh. Question 42, how do you remove the wave wind effect on the large open water? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, what you do is, ideally, you want to use the a HV, okay? because HV is less sensitive to the effects of uh, wind on, on water. And that confusion then of open water as, as land, as, as kind of a bare surface land. Are the data sets used in this demonstration global? Almost all the data sets are global. Actually, so we talked about this. The Sentinel-1 is, uh, is global. The population data is global. The tiger data is uh, just for the US. Actually, I'm sorry. So the, the tiger data is a population. data set. Okay, sorry, I, I clarify myself. The population data set is global, that's not the tiger. Um, and then the tiger data set, which has the roads, that is just for the US. Okay, the next question. Uh, 
Is there any possibility to import external shape files for training? Yes, I, uh, Google Earth Engine has an option to import your own files. Do I need to learn coding to use this data or are or there are already pre-coded things I can just follow? You can use, use this code and just modify the code to your area of interest. Question 46, how can I difference between urban areas and flooded vegetation? Both are represented by white color. So we've addressed this already in the previous questions. How successful have attempts been to automate these disaster mapping analysis processes? Question 47. As opposed to case by case basis, is each situation far too variable to allow automation? Uh, this is a really good question. I'm not sure I can fully answer this because I haven't attempted to automate it. Um, but I believe there are efforts or out there to uh, to automate uh, the use of SAR data for disaster mapping. And actually, a great example of that is the ARIA project. That's a, a JPL-led effort that provides information on on um, flooding, for example, and it has done some automation. It's still being improved, however. Okay, and I think, so that's it in terms of, oh, okay, let's, let's uh, a couple more questions. If included VH in my band selection, it fails, let me see. Okay, so we have a couple more. All right, if, if I include the H in my band selection, it fails. I'm assuming that polarization isn't available. That is correct. So it's um, HV. With Sentinel-1, it's HV. It's, uh, uh, hold on. Sorry, with Sentinel-1, I apologize. IW interferometric white swath is VH and VV. So it should not fail. Uh, I would suggest going back and revisiting your code. Sometimes there are little things that if you don't have quotes correctly, um, it'll, it'll give you an error. So make sure your code is correct. Question 49, how to separate out smooth land areas, high specular reflectance from those of surface matter in Google Earth Engine? I, I'm not sure what is meant here by surface matter. Question 50, is there any method offered by the Google Earth Engine for mapping flood based on an automatic comparison between the before and after images? Yeah, that's a good question. There might be, I, I, I'm not familiar with any, but there might be. Is SAR imagery better for agricultural crop classification? Which band is good for this purpose? That's question 51, that's a great question. And yes, you can use SAR imagery to distinguish different types of crops. We had a whole session on that, the, on the last advanced webinar series. 
I suggest you revisit that. Question 52, is the overlapping of the inundation output from supervised classification with the DM possible in Google Earth Engine to get the depth of inundation in flooded areas? If so, how? You can definitely overlap a DM to your uh, inundation classification. But in this case, you cannot get depth of inundation in flooded areas. Okay, I'll do uh, two more questions. I've seen most of the demonstration lectures in flat areas. How do we remove the shadow effect when dealing with flooding classification in the mountainous areas? That's a great question. And um, the best way to deal with shadow is just to create a mask and treat it as areas where there's no data. Question 54, what would be an acceptable SAR data latency for real-time disasters? That totally depends on the disaster. Uh, obviously, the quicker you have the data, the better it is. And I'll answer also, I, I read some comments about why I was using ascending images. Uh, the reason I was using ascending is because there was better coverage over this area with ascending images. Actually, there were no images um, for the time frame that I define um, in this, uh, for descending passes. That's why I used just ascending. Okay, so uh, we're a little bit past our, uh, our, our two hour session. I wanna thank all of you We'll put the questions online and we'll ask, actually finish answering these questions in the document so you can revisit these if we didn't get to your question. Uh, keep tuned because we have uh, two more uh, uh, webinars, uh, a great one tomorrow on landslide observations by Dr. Eric Fielding uh, and, and the one on Thursday uh, by Nicolas Grunfeld on generating a digital elevation model. Thank you very much for tuning in for all your questions and uh, we'll uh, be in touch again tomorrow. Stay tuned.